Is the class you're teaching how to get chocolate? Because I know a guy that can help you. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was stealing, it was handed over. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Willingly. Okay, if we don't have any other announcements, um, let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious day. We thank you for our children, our, our brethren that are here. Please watch over us and protect us. Put your hand upon Casey as he delivers his sermon, and upon the children's sermon as well. Open our hearts and our minds, so that we may learn more of you and how to follow you better. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There is one thing I just now remembered that I forgot to mention. It is in your bulletin. Friday, this Friday, the 12th, we'll have, fr we'll have a Friday Fun Fellowship. I said it. Um, there will be pizza and games and other fun stuff for K ages 1 to 92. Is anyone over 92 in here? Okay. I got less than one, though. One person? I'm sorry, Casey and Kim ruled you out, I guess. <laughs> Casey, can we make an exception? Her pastor will write a letter for her. Okay, your pastor will write you a letter and you'll, and you'll, and you'll have an excuse. <laughs> all right. So hopefully we'll see you all next Friday. And children, you met, you're welcome to come forward. Children, you're still a child. Tony, you qualify. Even if you don't want to, you qualify.
And my mother would churn and churn and churn, and pretty soon specks of butter would come, and they'd begin to gather together, and lo and behold, we'd have butter. We had leftover buttermilk, and we had skim milk, and my mother was supposed to feed that to you went silent. I know. I'm, I'm going to work on it for you, Vondell. <laughs> Wayne, let's switch. No more. We're going to we're going to just have you use mine. Okay. Oops. Take that one. Put it there. This one over here. Uh -oh. Wait, I don't have earrings. This one works for me. <laughs> I gotta figure out earrings. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Wait, if you take my ear off, I'm going to Well, we can get some duct tape to fix that. Can I just hold it? Sure. Will that work? Sure. Okay. Can everybody hear me now? Yes! Good! <coughs> well, back then we, we fed all of the skimmed milk and the buttermilk and everything to the pigs and to the turkeys and things like that. And so my mom poured it in a great big five gallon bucket which she set by the sink. Believe it or not, also back in that time, the chicken feed sacks were beautiful material, we, well, we thought it was anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and a neighbor lady came by and she had made me a, a pretty dress out of a feed sack with little yellow blossoms all over it. True to Miss Joanne's behavior, my mom and another lady were going somewhere. And she was going, my mom was going to wash my hands, and I backed up all ugly and sat down in the slop bucket where all of the milk and all of the table scraps and everything just sat right down in it. And my mom had to pull me out of there and get me cleaned up again. And that's kind of where I wanted to go today with this story. That there will be times in our life when we fall in the swamp bucket. <laughs> and by that I mean there are times in our lives when we will not be in God's will, when we will do things we're not supposed to do, and we will get all dirty. And what do we do about it? We turn to the one who can keep us from those things. Jesus. Jesus, yes. If we remember to pray, if we remember to listen, listen to God. Listen to what he tells you about our behavior and everything. And if we do that, you know what? He loves us so much. He cares for us so much. And he wants so much for us. And listening to him is the greatest reward that we can have, which is eternal life. And he can keep us from falling into slop buckets, okay? Now Artie's going to come and pray for us. Which ones? <laughs> <laughs> They're all the same. Yeah. <laughs> You get your choice of our least. Today. That's right. You get the best of both worlds. You get both of us. Well, it'll be the one I asked in the first place. Uh, oh. <laughs> if he remembers, he's supposed to do it. Oh. <laughs> you know, the, uh, I was sitting here thinking about while well, she was giving this message up here, and it is a message. But, you know, first of all, we have to take these little children. We're asking God to bless them. And he does. But you know, first of all, they're looking to us. 
we got to be an example for them to grow up and to be. Wondell's going to tell me you need a microphone. Of course she had. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it says uh, that, you know, they, we got to be an example for them. And if we're an example in our everyday life, uh, if we're an example in our prayer lives, uh, be of good uh, conscience, you know, it takes us to, to lead them. And then watch God prosper them and let them grow up and to be in something that we're so thankful to have, you know. I, I'm thinking back about uh, several years ago, I was over washing my car at one of these car washes, and this guy came out of the car bay and he had to wash his car. And this little bitty kid, little bitty thing, Daddy, Daddy, I would, let me do that, Daddy. Look, give me that. I want to do that. Let me help you, Daddy. He's asking for permission to be part of everything and, you know, and to learn. And we got to be able to take time to let them learn. And he gave him a chamois and said, okay, you go ahead, son. He was making a mess of it, but it was okay with the dad. So let's bow our heads down and ask God to bless the children. Father, we thank you for so much for these youngsters. We thank you for the life that they have. We thank you, Lord, for just taking care of them and help us that we can always be a blessing to them, to be a guiding light as well. So, Lord, we thank you for taking care of them, blessing them, and blessing this church for having so many children. We just love you so much, dear God. And we just thank you for Jesus and his love. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen. 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 In, in this brand new country, this, this young nation, 
he wanted to, to promote virtue, so he actually became, well, he got a nickname. His nickname was Parson. He was called Parson Weems. And Parson Weems didn't just want to talk about Washington and, and his virtues. He wanted our nation to put virtues first, forefront of our new country. Okay. Seems like a reasonable thing. Except for one problem. In telling this story about George Washington refusing to lie, even when he had an opportunity and might have been better off for his bottom if he hadn't, you know? <laughs> Parson Weems actually lied about this story. It didn't happen. There are no other evidence, there is no else, nowhere else where this story was ever written. None of George Washington's family could have said, oh yeah, by the way, do you remember when George was a little boy? Nobody ever claimed that this event happened other than Parson Weems. So today it's pretty much uh, agreed upon that the story about telling the truth in and of itself is actually a lie. Now if that doesn't seem very modern to you, that I, this was over 200 years ago. Yeah, that seems pretty modern. Today, do you hear things that are supposed to be true that you find out maybe later not so true? Anybody have Facebook? That, that never happens on Facebook. We actually, we actually created a new word for that. It's a brand new word. Just add it to the dictionary. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's on the news all the time. Have you ever heard of alternative facts? Yeah. Oh. Things that are true but not so true, you know. Apparently, presidents and, and, and truth that has been an issue all along, <laughs> from the beginning. Um, but this story is kind of funny. Today I want to talk to you about telling the truth. If you got your Bible ready, like I said, we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 20. The verse says, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. So what is false testimony? What does that mean? It's a lie. You shall not lie is pretty much what this is saying. If, if lying is not to be done, what does that say about white lies, little white lies? Anybody ever have a little white lie? Husbands, your wife ever ask you where you've been? Or even worse, how do I look in this dress? You know, the little white lies, you, you might be familiar with those. According to Moses, this is Deuteronomy now, this is, this is God's word through Moses, we should not give false testimony against the neighbor. We should not lie. Well, this sermon could be about those white lies. We could even talk about whoppers. We could talk about those alternative facts. We could just talk about outright fiction. I'm sure you, you've experience people telling you some things that weren't so true. But I really want to take this sermon time to look at what a lie is. What is true and what is a lie? Well, let me ask you a question. What was the very first lie ever spoken? Anybody know what the very first lie ever spoken was? Garden of Eden. So if you got your Bible, we're going to go back to, to Genesis, Garden of Eden. That's way back. First book, Genesis. Arlie's ready. He's got his smartphone. I, I gotta, you're impressing me today, brother. I like that. Genesis chapter 4. Sorry, chapter 3, verse 4, I meant to say. Genesis 3, 4. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Well, how did that work out for Eve? <laughs> that didn't play out so well. That is the actual very first ever recorded lie. Who, does this, who is this that's speaking here? That's Satan. Satan is speaking. Did you know that Jesus actually was talking to some, some Pharisees, some, some leaders, in John chapter 8, 
And he addresses this idea of Satan and lying. The very first lie ever was Satan. And unfortunately, Adam and Eve, they bought that lie. They believed what they had been told. But Jesus speaks to that. So if you've got your Bible, I'm going to have you flip around and we're going to go forward again. We're going to go to John chapter 8. I, I spoke to you the other day about a uh, story in John chapter 8. Well, this is 43 and 44. And Jesus here has been talking to a group of, of Jewish leaders. And, and they're not understanding at all what he's trying to tell them. Uh, he's not, well, they're not ready to hear what Jesus has to say. And he speaks to this, and he says, Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. I don't think he's being sarcastic there. Me, I understand if, if I'm trying to explain something and someone doesn't understand it, I might get a little sarcastic and say, you're just unable to even understand it. But Jesus is speaking truth there. He says, Because you are unable to hear what I say. And he explains that. He says in verse 44, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires? He was a murderer from the beginning. Murderer in the beginning how? With Adam and Eve. They ended up dying. He says, you were, He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Amen. He speaks his native language. Unfortunately, i got to say, I've met some people in my time whose native language was pretty much the same thing Jesus is talking about here. Lies. I, I, I got to think of some students that I've had in my class. Didn't finish your homework, so what, where's your homework today? Lies. There you go. Those dogs. They must like that high fiber diet. But Satan is the father of lies. Lies are his native language. The very first lie, Satan. Well, if, if lies are of Satan, and, and Satan, Satan is the originator, the very first liar, he is the father of all lies, well, what is the possible contrast with this idea of Satan and lies? What's the total opposite of that? Truth. Truth. This is John again, so we're going to go to John chapter 18. This is Jesus again. Jesus responded, You say I am a king? Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. This is Jesus in front of Pilate at his trial. And Jesus, or Jesus has asked this important question in verse 38. Pilate asks, what is truth? What is truth? Jesus is in front of Pilate. He's been accused of, of, of lots of different things. The, the Jews want him crucified. Pilate is given the job of, of determining whether Jesus should be punished, whether or not he should be crucified. He's heard all these claims from the Jews and, and what Jesus said or, and what Jesus did or, or did not do. And Pilate asks a famous question. What is truth? Jesus said, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. Jesus is the truth. If you're looking for the opposite of Satan and the opposite of those lies, it's with Jesus. And, and as a matter of fact, that truth is not just for Jesus. It's not just for Pilate, which, by the way, did Pilate actually recognize the truth when, when Jesus was standing right in front of him? No. Jesus stood right in front of him and said, I'm here to testify to the truth. And Pilate still did not understand it, even after he asked Jesus about what is truth. He didn't understand it. Yet, here we are, 2,000 years later, and are there people in our society that, today that are wondering, well, what's the truth? What is true today? Like I mentioned, you got Facebook. Is Facebook true? No. 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 
Sorry, but Facebook is, is not so much on the truth uh, there. Um, even news reports. You have alternative facts. You have news reports that, that, that this news agency will, will conflict and, and say a different story than this news agency. So, so things that, and institutions that we used to be able to trust can't trust so much anymore. We have people that they used to be trusted. You know who the most trusted person in America used to be, at least when I was growing up? Does anybody know? Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite was chosen as the most trusted person in America. Every night, Walter Cronkite, CBS News. That don't happen so much anymore. We don't even trust our doctors anymore. In my house, you, you all might know this reference when I say, in my house, Dr. Brower's word was golden. Does anybody remember Dr. Brower and Glenn? Dr. Brower could do no wrong. If he claimed it, he said it, he diagnosed it, that was it. Yeah. Today, do we even trust our doctors? No. no. Second opinions, got to go get you a second opinion. Got to do that today. We are not a people at a time in our society where truth is really easy to spot, I guess. We might even be like Pilate and, and have the truth right in front of us. Right there. We can literally reach out and touch it, and yet we don't recognize the truth that's right in front of us. Amen. As a matter of fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you all something right now. I had you open your Bibles. That's the very first thing I did. I said, turn to Deuteronomy. You got something true right in front of you, right there on your lap. That truth is there, just waiting for you. Jesus speaks about this. This is in John again. Man, kind of John centric sermon today. This is John chapter 14. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Does anybody know the second part of that? No one comes to the Father except through me. In our society today, we have all these different truths. You know, I respect your beliefs. You're, you're, you're free to, to, to believe what you're going to believe. That, that's a nice sentiment. But does that mean that without Jesus, that there's salvation? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's nothing else. That's right. You, you can have whatever beliefs you want, and, and I'll respect your, your, your decision to have those beliefs. But according to that scripture, according to the true word that you have right there on your lap, Jesus is the only way that's going to lead to that salvation. That's, right. that's it. Amen. You can believe what you want. You're free. You have free will to choose whatever belief you want. But don't delude yourself and be confused about what is true and be like Pilate and not recognize it when it is right in front of you, literally staring in right there in your face. <laughs> Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now, how do we get to participate in that truth? I want to show you one last verse, also from John. This is John chapter 8, verse 31. So I'll give you a, a little bit of time to, to flip back a little bit to chapter 8. This is the second half of, of 31. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you hold to my teaching, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. So if you're looking for truth, if you, if, you, if, I don't know, if you're if you're confused about what's in front of you, Jesus' teaching is the way to clarify that, is to clear it all up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you all a, a sad thing in my life. Now, on the list of, of relative sad things that could be in my life, this is probably not really high on the list, but it's still a sad thing. I had to buy something last month that I've never had to purchase before in my life. I had to actually buy reading glasses. Brother, I'm right there with you. You're laughing with me or at me? Which is that? All right, that's better. I appreciate that, Paul. Thank you. 
I had to buy reading glasses for the first time. My eyesight has got to the point where if it's small text, or if it's text that's not a high contrast, you know, like black on white, if it's like, I don't know, like on here, if it's like black on black, I don't even know why they bother trying to do that. I cannot read things that are small or things that have low contrast. I got some magnified reading glasses for the first time. And it makes me kind of think of this idea. Whatever I read, from a, from a book to a magazine to a Kindle, whatever I'm looking at, an iPad, whatever it may be, that text is right in front of my face. It is present right there. Now, in my relatively old age, I guess, I don't know, <laughs> my eyesight has gotten to where I can't recognize what is right in front of me. I can't tell without something to clarify. <laughs> I don't have to do without reading. I don't have to just look at that and try to guess, well, is that an A or is that an O? Yeah. <laughs> I have something that clarifies it, that clears it up, that allows me to know what is true. Those glasses show me exactly what those words truly say in front of my face. Jesus is saying here, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus' teaching is like those reading glasses of mine. They clarify whatever you're confused about. We've been talking about these Ten Commandments. This is number nine. We've been talking about them for months. If there's something that's unsure or not clear or you're confused about in those Ten Commandments, well, my gosh, go back and look at that Bible in front of you. Look at what Jesus has to say about it, and it's going to be cleared up for you. Jesus can clear up whatever confusion, whatever is, is making you not sure about the truth. It can be fixed, just like my glasses fix things for me. Right? Now, I'm going to ask you a question, or at least I'm going to ask you to, to forgive me, maybe. You notice I'm not wearing my glasses this morning. Right? <laughs> so, so maybe that analogy doesn't play itself out. I'm going to ask you, do you take Jesus' teaching with you? Or is it just for sitting at your house? My glasses, they ain't going anywhere. They're sitting in my house. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still not at the point where I'm going to put those things on and, and walk around and, and use them here. But, but the analogy breaks down there because I'm asking you that if you allow Jesus' teaching to, to clarify things, that that's not just something you pack up and, and you keep at your house. I'm asking you to share that. That's right. Is that a public thing? Is that something that you share with people? We've talked about that before. The best way to witness to folks, the best way to tell them what is true, is to tell them how God has worked That's in your right. life. That is it. Who's going to argue and say, nope, sorry, the Lord didn't do that? Who's going to argue? It's your life. You can sit there and you can open your Bible and talk about theology all day. You can talk about, well, we're going to be you know, pre-millennial, post-millennial. We're going to be predestination. You can get into all kinds of theological arguments. But there is no way that if you put this teaching in your life and you know what's true and you share that with folks, that anybody can stand up and argue with you and tell you, no, that is not true. The truth, once you allow Jesus' teaching in your life, the truth is now a part of you. It, it's an intimate part of you. It, it's, it's inhabiting your life. That's what the Holy Spirit does, by the way. You share how God's working in your life, and now you're not just reading the truth. The truth is not just in a, a page in front of you or a screen in front of you. The truth is now in you, and it's a part of your life. And now you get to actually be sharing that. You get to, to, to witness to that. And the truth that started 2,000 years ago and was transmitted in that Bible is now part of you, and you get to be part of that transmission. Amen. 
That's a huge thing that the Holy Spirit, if you allow it, can do in your life. Right. Huge. <coughs> so if you don't understand the truth, I, I guess I'm speaking to two things. If, if you're not understanding the truth, then maybe that Bible is the place to start. Look for that truth. And if you've already experienced that truth, then my, my commission to you, my challenge to you, is to get out and share it. You should be part of that truth, and, and the truth needs to be shared. Ted, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I'll, I'll pray, and, and then we'll have our...